an honor to be here. Thank you, David. Thank you all for being here. And um, thanks, many thanks for the Aga Khan program for this it's wonderful good. opportunity. Oh, it's good. It's good? Yes, we can't hear, we can't hear that. Okay, I'll speak up. Speak up. Okay. I mean, there's nothing coming out of these are the yeah. speakers. Okay. So my presentation today is about Arab-Islamic notion of readership, broadly conceived, and uh, how the dynamics of knowledge sharing um, shapes cultural and political conceptions of legitimacy. So I'll be using readership as a perspective to reimagine the Umayyad caliphal century in Al-Andalus, which is the fourth in Hijri calendar and the tenth uh, AD. I decided for today to structure the presentation on the Arabic medieval uh, model of adab, the word we use for belled. It was said in Al-Andalus, if you choose to be a scientist, uh, you have to master one branch of knowledge. But if you wanted to become a scholar of adab, adib, you then need to be trained in all forms of knowledge. So the, the way an author uh, would make an argument in Cordoba, in the uh, center I'm speaking about, would have been by selecting separate segments of stories and short reports, khabar, surah al-akhbar, from multiple sources, ordered carefully, so um, each would highlight one aspect of the argument, and then together would form a statement. So that today I chose um, uh, a number of segments, and at the end of each, I'll ask a few questions so we can reflect together on uh, the argument I'm proposing here. And I wanted to start with this quote, um, which I think all of us can relate to. And this is coming at a long tradition that starts with the early centuries of Islam being an oral culture. So I'm fascinated by the journey, uh, the, the relationship with, with books and with reading develops to that stage. So segment one. This is a verse from the Quran from Surah to tawbah um, or repentance, which is a Medinan surah that was revealed in association with the expedition of Tabuk uh, that the Prophet prepared against the Byzantine just a year before his hijrah. Um, I'm going to read the Arabic for you. وعد الله المؤمنين والمؤمنات جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها ومساكن طيبة في جنات عدن ورضوان من الله أكبر ذلك هو الفوز العظيم. In the English translation, I kept the word uh, عدن or عدن uh, since it's ambiguous in the sources at in and in. Uh, it inspired a number of interpretations. In one of the earliest uh, interpretations of the Quran, Tafsir by Muqatil bin Sulaiman al Balkhi, who died in the year 130 for Hijrah, uh, he explains the verse like this. He says it refers to a palace of, of ruby and pearl where a perfumed breeze blows from under the throne, al Arsh, with dunes of white musk. Now this imagery certainly recalls a scene from the desert re-embedded within the generic plural uh, mention of palaces. Uh, about 150 years later, one of the leading scholars of Baghdad at the time, a tabari who died in 310, produces his own exegesis, which became a canonical source. About this verse, he tells us, it's a palace in heaven made of pearls with 70 ha uh, houses made of red ruby. In each there are 70 rooms made of green emerald. And in each room there are 70 beds. On each there is a wife of the beautiful virgins, Hur al -Ain. And in each room, 70 banquets with 70 different kinds of food will be served, also surrounded by 70 servants. And the believer is granted much strength to take it all in completely at once. Uh, the pleasure promised to the believers takes the form of banquets, many foods, promise of sexual pleasure, but also equally pleasurable is the space itself, 
and the options available, so the variety, multiplicity, and abundance. And lastly, the aesthetic aspect of all this, with the rubies being green and red and the pearls. So ultimate bliss in heaven is something that you can taste, you can appreciate aesthetically, and you can inhabit, especially here compared to the first interpretation, which looked more like a still image with breeze blowing. Now, of the word Adan or Adan itself, a tabari compiles available interpretations and presents all of them as equally valid. He writes, Adan might be referring to the inner cal caliber of those who reside in heaven, Ma'dan. Or it could refer to the heart of heaven, Bitan, or its middle part, or perhaps it's the name of a river in heaven, or possibly a city in heaven, or a particular palace named Adan with 5,000 gates, all especially reserved for the prophets, the righteous, and martyrs. And this is a direct quote from At-Tabari. Here we see the appreciation for multiplicity, or the notion that there are multiple versions and opinions and possible meanings. And this sustainability of multiplicity, I would like to stress here, became a guiding feature of knowledge production in medieval Islamic societies. The description keeps changing. The material includes precious stones, gold, and then the actual architecture transforms itself with every interpretation. And what is most striking, I guess, is the sense of scale that changes. And I have here a map for you. Um, if we look at uh, the lighter uh, expansion of the Islamic world by the year uh, 1500 compared to the darker part which was the Islamic world during the Umayyad dynasty. So it's an empire that's clearly expanding. With the Suyuti, a later Mufassir from the early 10th century who was writing uh, in the 1500s, so about six centuries after the Tabari, the same verse becomes about 100 degrees of heaven. The lowest degree alone has for each resident a thousand palaces. And here's my favorite part. The distance between each palace takes a year to cross walking. And each palace, of course, abounds with beautiful virgins, young boys, Ghilman, and Laurel, Rayhan. Can we perhaps look at these scholars as different readers of, the, of this piece? How much does they reflect the general sensibilities of their own respective audiences? And how do the characteristics of each interpretation correspond to the broader cultural imagination of the time? Can we speak of an aesthetic reading for these worlds, which are completely imagined within the semantic possibilities of an ambiguous word, Adan? What kind of readers they demand we become to inhabit these worlds? Now, segment two. A contested story surrounds the biographical information we have of the eponym of the Hanafi law school, one of the four main Sunni schools uh, in Islam, Hanafi, Hanbali, Shafi, and Maliki. Abu Hanifa was born in Kufa in the year 80 for Hijra. And the controversy uh, centers around whether Abu Hanifa met Anas bin Malik, who died in the year 93 for Hijra and who was one of the closest companions of the Prophet. If the two had actually met, Abu Hanifa would have been 13 or younger. And for those who insist that the two met, the question becomes, did Abu Hanifa as a boy at the time only see Anas bin Malik, or did he actually hear him speak? We can imagine Anas bin Malik, a highly celebrated scholar at the time, sitting at his majlis, surrounded by circles of scholars who were eager to copy what he has to say, to transmit knowledge from him. We can imagine the circle parting for the young boy Abu Hanifa to enter the room and see Anas. That, for those who believe the meeting had happened, was the moment when Abu Hanifa gained the prestigious status of a successor. Abu Hanifa was a very controversial figure, and this story relates to broader issues about his authority and reliability. But what's interesting for me here in this story is the structure of knowledge transmission, which we have a perfect prophetic hadith that expresses that for us. So in this circle, the prophet is at the center. 
Uh, the people who met the prophet are the best qualified as sources of knowledge, and they were called the companions, the capital C, as Sahaba, and they are the first circulator. Those who met the companions are called the successors at Tabi'un, and the story of Abu Hanifa about him meeting Anas is basically placing him from the third circle into the second, so closer to the source. So the relationship between the circles is direct contact. This notion of authority inspired what became known as the principle of tabakat, literally meaning generations. Tracing uh, intellectual genealogies back to the source became a science on its own right and was known as isnad. And thus, the guiding principle for organizing knowledge in history took a hierarchical, generational, contact-based structure. So when we read any piece of information from that time period, it has to start with, we heard it from so-and-so, or it was narrated to us from so-and-so, or while I was at this place, so-and-so said something and someone else reacted to it. This became a, a, like a definite markers of the transmission of knowledge. Sort of what we do when we put quotes and uh, footnotes. Um, the sophistication of knowledge production was taking place in different parts of the Islamic world. But I'm interested in what was happening when the second circle was reaching the third. And that's when actually the Abbasids were in Baghdad. Um, it's around the time Harun al-Rashid, the um, you know, was one of the most famous caliphs. He was celebrated even by his enemies, the Umayyads in Al-Andalus. He was, uh, you know, appropriated as a model of successful ruler. He's even in the Arabian Nights as a major character. So Harun al-Rashid and his two sons, Amin al-Ma'mun, especially al-Ma'mun. The Abbasids experimented for quite some time in articulating the right to the caliphate. Of the many competing parties, were they the most eligible? A changing basis for their legitimacy indicates that the effect of the rebellions that broke against them, especially those that were led by the descendants of the prophet through his daughter Fatima and his son-in-law and cousin, um, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who in the eyes of many uh, were the rightful claimants to the caliphate. Uh, this is definitely true of uh, some members of the Abbasid family itself. You know, with al-Ma'mun, he actually designated one of the descendants of the Prophet, Imam Ali al-Rida, as his successor. He even minted his name in a, on, a, on the coins. He changed the color of the Abbasid caliphate from black to green. So he recognized that they were perhaps more uh, eligible. One argument in particular was innovative at the time. In support of the Abbasids, an account was produced claiming the following. Ali was the prophet's legatee, Wasi, who had been succeeded by his son, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafi, who then passed the imamate to his son, Abu Hashim who then gave it to the Abbasids during a visit to Syria. What happened, according to the report, was that he had been poisoned by the Umayyads. And when he realized that, he was in a hurry to settle his affairs, to hand down his wasiya, and with it, the right to rule the Muslim community. It happened that the Abbasids lived uh, in Syria at the time, so were within reach, whereas the Alids, his own family, resided in Medina. So he passed it to the Abbasids instead. It's a curious account, multiple versions, and politically it's very fragile, easily refutable from many angles. But what's quite interesting here is how the argument for political legitimacy in the story very much speaks to an audience who is quite familiar with and respectful of the reliability of direct transmission. Uh, as advanced and stabilized in the realm of knowledge production, that we see here. My claim here is the following. At a time of crisis and contestation, caliphal legitimacy, which strongly privileged lineage and wiratha, which is succession within the same family, in this story inhabits ideals of authority that were designated by the tradition of Isnad. Authority takes an almost concrete form, and the direct contact with the Abbasids 
takes precedence over the eligibility of the ballots. Okay. Segment three. So this is one of the most beautiful eliminated manuscripts uh, of all times. It's Makamat al-Hariri um, and um, uh, illustrated by al -Wasiti. And David wrote the most absolute authoritative article on <laughs> On this, on this work. So Arabo-Islamic culture had been characterized as primarily oral in the first centuries of Islam. This was to change uh, fairly quickly with the growth of literacy and the refinement of the Arabic script, but primarily also because of the introduction of paper in the year 133 for the Hijrah. The story is that the Muslim troops captured uh, some Chinese uh, soldiers and they knew how to make paper, and that's how it became uh, accessible to the Islamic world. Um, yes. Scholarship detected increasing reliance on the written word alongside the oral in the third and fourth centuries of, of uh, Islam. Professor Tula uh, Turawa calls this the writerly culture. He tells us that by the third century, we see a transition, not from oral to written or from non-literate to literate, but rather from predominantly oral to combinations of oral and written. Uh, this transition prepared the emergence for the culture of books and scribes, of literary salons, booksellers, the wadakun, of libraries and of book veneration. We could speak of communities of scholars who exchange knowledge and debate freely to a certain extent. So we're keeping the old structure of knowledge transmission uh, that we see in the model of, tab of tabakat generations, but there is also increasingly powerful new trends uh, of exchanging knowledge that this picture kind of best represents. Scholars visually being um, portrayed as equal. At the same time that this change has been taking place, we have a, a um, uh, a great scholar from Baghdad, Ibn Qutayba, writing his book on Shar wa Shu'ara, on poets and poetry. Uh, and in his book, he proposes a, a very interesting view on knowledge. He says, God did not limit poetry, knowledge, and rhetoric, as Shar wa Al-Ilm wa al to one age to the exclusion of another. Nor did he single out people over another, but rather, God shared and divided these among his servants in every age and made every old new in their own time. So in poetry, in literature, this notion of what the best source of knowledge is is being debated from new angles. Segment four. This quote uh, is from Abu Ahmad al-Samarkandi, who died in 463, in his book, The Ethics of the Narrator and the Etiquette of the Audience, a book that reflects on being a scholar on the social markers of this profession. He tells us, Man talab al-ilma, aflis. Whomever seeks knowledge becomes bankrupt. It's indeed the profession of the poor. When the inkwells in enter a house, he tells us, the entire family suffers. <laughs> so he gives the following advice. <laughs> I thought we'd all relate to that. <laughs> when you walk into someone's house and see an inkwell, have pity on them. And if you have something on you, feed them. He further shares the perspective of those who spend their lives seeking knowledge in these lines of poetry. An inkwell I spend my day with is dearer to my heart than the company of a friend. And a bundle of papers in my possession is more pleasing to me than the finest meal. And the slap of a scholar on my cheek is sweeter to me than drinking nectar. So here we see scholars completely dedicated to their work, yet poor and nomadic to a certain extent. Being barefoot, he tells us somewhere else, is a sign of humility that seeking knowledge requires. But he mentions walking barefoot as a sign of madness too, because it was taken days and even weeks for scholars 
uh, who were seeking knowledge from one center to another, going to meet and learn at the hands of the masters. Now, by the second and third centuries of Islam, this became a distinct tradition called Rihla fi Talab al Alam, or to travel in search of knowledge, and it was held in high esteem. Uh, kind of similar to today, you go from one school <coughs> to another, from one city to another. And it also, uh, at the time, it relates to another important concept, with it, which is consensus, ijma. So if you travel to many centers, it means you're quite aware of the general consensus. Now with the 10th century, that's the fourth in Hijri calendar, we start seeing a reversal of this tradition. We have a famous scholar from the East, <coughs> Ali al-Qali, who uh, decides to take a different kind of journey. After traveling in search of knowledge for years, and after collecting the best treasures of each science, as he tells us, he starts a new kind of search, this time looking for excellent readers. And that leads him to Al-Andalus. So he travels to the palace of Abdurrahman III, the first Umayyad Caliph, whose reputation as the best reader of fine literature reached the farthest corners of the land and piqued Al-Qali's interest, as he claims. But the greatness of the Caliph, Al-Qali tells us, was contingent upon his reception of Al-Qali's work. He uses the metaphor of the jeweler, Ba'i al-Jawahir, as his model. The composition of a work of adab in this metaphor constitutes a form of gift for which the recipient, the caliph, in this example, is bound by an obligation to give a counter gift in the form of protection, recognition, and of course money. In light of this, the concept of adab as a form of tijara raises the question about the prestige works of adab carried at the time. There is another fascinating story about the Book of Songs, and this is uh, Abu Faraj al Asfahani, who Ibn Khalikan, in his biographical dictionary, tells us he spent 50 years collecting everything related to music and songs. But when he finished his work, he was quite devastated because no one cared. And then he heard about the Umayyad Caliph in Cordoba. And he created this new copy, and he made it just magnificent, decorated it with precious stones, and sent it to Al-Hakam II. And the story goes on that Al-Hakam was rejoiced and sent a very, very generous uh, you know, gift. We are to understand these stories as narrative techniques to establish the authority of their respective authors. They are also important tropes reflecting on the politics of the East and West, uh, which was always a competition. Yet they describe books as precious gifts and show an interest in recognition, in patronage, but also in readership. And then we have the reputation of the Umayyad Caliphs as generous patrons, but also as the best readers of their time. And I'm curious to share with you what was happening in Al-Andalus and how this image of the Caliph as a best reader of his time reflects on their political project. Segment five. Um, this could be one of the most famous um, lines of poetry in Arabic. Um, it's the opening of what is known as Al-Mu'allaqat, or Suspended Oats by Umru Al-Qais. It's one of seven poems that were honored by being uh, suspended on the wall of the Kaaba. The scene here describes the weeping poet standing before the campsite of his beloved, now reduced to ruins. It became a poetic tradition in classical Arabic poetry, the opening part where the lover's departure inspires a reflection on loss, on emptiness, on silence, on the limits of language. Um, we have examples of poets trying to make the ruins speak or expressing sheer despair when their silence uh, continues. There is a beautiful imagery from uh, Labid's Ode, and it starts, uh, or the third line actually, فَوَقَفْتُ أَسْأَلُهَا وَكَيْفَ سُؤَالُنَا ثُمَّنْ خَوَالِدَا مَا يَبِينُ كَلَامُهَا 
Uh, so he stands before the ruins and is asking about his beloved who departed, and they do not answer. And then he asks himself, how can I even begin to ask them? They're the mute immortals. And this is uh, Professor Suzanne Stetkevich's beautiful translation, and she uses that as actually a title for her book. So this is a major example of loss becoming an event of creativity. We have several interpretations of why the beginning is the, in the dual form. So it's qifa, qifa, nabki, so qifa is uh, the imperative, but it's addressing two people. Was the poet perhaps talking to two companions, or was he talking to one companion and himself? We do not know. But what's interesting for me is that there is a listener, an immediate reader for this scene, someone we can easily uh, assume a position we can assume as readers. Now I'll take you a few centuries uh, later, uh, right after the fall of the Umayyad Caliphate in Al-Andalus, which resulted in the displacement and alienation of an entire generation of scholars who had strong ties to the Umayyad court. Among them, you might recognize the name of Ibn Hazm. But here I want to talk about a poet, Abu Amir Ibn Shuhayb who was born in 382 and who died in 1035, who was from Cordoba. And when the city fell, he was devastated. And he gave us the first elegy for the city of Cordoba. So Ritha Madinot Cordoba was uh, the first uh, that he wrote. He copes with the loss in a different way, though. He takes a journey with a companion from the demons, a jinni, with whom he mounts a magic horse that takes them on a trip to the valley of Abqar, Wadi Abqar. And as they cross one sphere after another, al Jawaf al Jawa, into a land that's green and fragrant, the companion announces, you have reached the land of demons, O Abu Amir. In this valley, the poet freely moves within different centuries, conjuring up the spirits of his favorite poets and competing with each one of them in a separate scene always in the presence of his companion, Zawba, who also functions as his immediate reader. We have fragments of this work that survived in a later work, Bassam's uh, Zakhira, Ibn Bassam's Zakhira, and the title is Risalat al-Tawabi' wa Zawabi' The Spirits of in Inspiration and the Genie, Zawba. The message of the work is that Ibn Shuhayb, despite the complete collapse of the social order that sustained his elite position as a poet, could equal, if not surpass, all those who came before him. Displaced from the Kurdoman court, Ibn Shuhayb embeds himself within a different circle, that of great poets. Thinking of the two examples, I invite you here to think of the epistemological projects entailed in standing before the ruins of a deserted camp, as in the case of the Mu'allaka, and in taking an imaginary horse and traveling through time to the land of demons. Accepting loss as an event through which the poets rewrote themselves into a new world order in al Mu'allaqat, compared to the ability to confront loss by reimagining the world into a new order, as Ibn Shuhayb does. Well, for Ibn Shuhay, poetry was the finest art, superior to other forms of knowledge, especially superior to compilations and anthologies, which, was, uh, which were extremely popular in Al-Andalus during his time. Ibn Shuhay took every opportunity to criticize that trend. He finds classification lacking intele intellectual acumen and rigor, especially when measured against poetry. He extends this attitude to total rejection to transmitted knowledge altogether. When asked about the works of former scholars, he says, I, I don't read that stuff. When asked specifically about uh, Al Khalil bin Ahmad al Farahidi, an iconic scholar, he says he couldn't read his work because the book is in his trash, Zambil. As for the book of Sibawe, another iconic scholar, he says he couldn't read it either because his cat pooped on it. <laughs> so despite this complete uh, rejection of anthologies and transmitted knowledge, 
I would suggest here that Ibn Shuhayt's poetry and the diegetical words he could innovate and inhabit are made possible through the reverberations of ideals and practices, encyclopedic classification cultivated in the realm of knowledge production. That Ibn Shuhayb could select and choose presupposes fragmentation of the world. And this is a practice that became available culturally within the work of anthologies in the fourth Hijri century. This, I propose, also allowed Ibn Shuhayb to reorder the geography and history of the world to make it all revolve around him at the center. My last segment. The Umayyad century started in the year 300 with a Cordoba celebrating their new Emir, Abdul Rahman III, who in 16 years after beginning as an Emir announced himself a Caliph, and announced Cordoba the center of the Islamic world. Now, I'm very curious about what was happening in his palace and in Cordoba that inspired that decision. And for that, we have one of my favorite works, The Necklace, um, a Lakud, an encyclopedic anthology that was produced by Ibn Abd Rabbihi al Qurtubi al Andalusi. Um, <coughs> okay. The Necklace was an ambitious project of unprecedented scope themes, vernacular, and range of genres. Put up the books here to let you have a sense of the work. What's most remarkable is the sophistication of classification. This is a work that's coming after the third century, which was called the, the age of organization and canonization. So this is a step after that. He is within the fifth generation of scholars using the written form of the writerly culture that I mentioned earlier. And he's also one of the earliest scholars to comfortably confess that all his sources are books. So he didn't do the rihla fi talab al-alam. He didn't travel seeking knowledge. He actually never left Cordoba. At this stage, we can speak about the primacy of choreographic thinking, where analytical, categorical classification was possible and even necessary. We can speak about understanding the world abstractly. Um, for his work, Ibn Abd Rabbihi borrows the metaphor of the necklace, which is, uh, he explains the ethical and aesthetic conception of knowledge through that, and it's quite beautiful. But it's also a metaphor that celebrates the idea of multiple kinds of knowledge as precious stones threaded separately into a totality. Uh, Ibn Abd Rabihi tells us he was just overwhelmed by the ubiquity of knowledge around him and decided to produce a work that represents the entirety of human knowledge by selecting from the best br in each branch of, of science. With books replacing scholars as prestigious sources of knowledge, we can trace here a transformation in the notion of literary authority. The source loses its centrality. Ibn Abd Rabbihi tells us, take knowledge from wherever you may find it. Uh, with this view of knowledge, also Ibn Abd Rabbihi departs from the primacy of Isnad, chains of transmission. He tells us, I eliminated Isnad from most of my reports. Uh, but he takes few pages to justify it, so we can tell it was controversial at the time, and he, he needed to actually convince people of why he did it. But if Isnad is a record of the genealogy of knowledge, its elimination can be interpreted as a form of separation and independence from the Islamic case. It assumes political resonance as it secures a level, a level of anonymity and thus provides flexibility for Ibn Abd Rabbihi to shape the meaning of his reports independent of their original context. The elimination of Isnad helps him with one very clear political goal, rebranding Cordoba as a center. So instead of transmitting knowledge, he's actually selecting from it to reproduce it. So it's an act of ownership. So the decision to relocate the emphasis from the source to the material thus prioritizes the process of selection. اختيار الكلام, selection, Ibn Abd Rabbihi tells us, is more difficult than composing it because it's an intellectual en endeavor. 
And he goes a step further and he says, it's a practice that I invite all of you, my readers, to, to do. Let any person look fairly into my books, my selection, and let them make their intellect aql, a just arbiter and a decisive judge. Uh, couldn't resist sharing the rest of it, but I'm not going to talk about it. With this epistemological project uh, of the necklace, Ibn Abdrabi innovates a progressive trajectory that privileges the present over the past by claiming that those who, ca who came last are the best, a position he extends, as I will show in a minute, to the political history of Islam. He writes, I have noted that the last of every generation and of those who recorded wise sayings and written in all manners of literary works has been sweeter in wording, easier in structure, wiser in procedure, and clearer in method. Because those who come later can review and criticize. So basically can be naqidun muta'akkibun, while those who came first were beginners. So we saw with Ibn Qutayba saying every generation can produce great knowledge. Ibn Abd Rabbi is saying no. My generation, I personally produce the best knowledge. At this juncture, I want to briefly just uh, share that with organizing knowledge, anthology is necessarily invest in cultural conservation. And this is an aspect of the Andalusi Caliphate that they were actively trying to collect and preserve. Um, so the progression into copious knowledge revealed encyclopedic character in Al-Andalus. So literature was function in anthologies as an archive. It's more urgent, perhaps, that we detect at this point in copious sensibilities a distinct style of knowledge in which anthologies serve a discursive and representational spaces. In a sense, an anthology promises an abstracted, fragmented, yet classified and ordered representation of the world. Um, Okay, so I will choose here how this notion of anthologies as representational spaces, this idea of dividing knowledge into segments and into placing them separately into uh, one whole, in one book from the necklace, which is um, The Second Adorable Jewel on Caliphs, Their Histories and Battles in which uh, Ibn Abd al-Rabihiri imagines Islamic history to the point where Abd al-Rahman III was being crowned as, as a caliph. The fragmentary presentation of the encyclopedic form allows Ibn Abd al-Rabihiri to introduce very interesting aspects of this history. First, he shows us all the Umayyad caliphs successively, one after the other. And the presentation is synonymous, like their, their uh, biographical notices are very similar as if the representation itself replaces the histories, where, wh which were very, um, uh, like nothing like a succession, right? There were murders, there were struggles, tensions, but they're all eclipsed in the way he represents the successive rules. Then, and more importantly, he presents an uninterrupted genealogy that sutures all the gaps and interruptions in the line of rulership. So he takes us from Medina and Mecca with the prophet starting um, um, you know, Islamic rulership to Damascus and from Damascus he skips to Cordoba. So the Abbasids are actually just easily just uh, with uh, uh, forgotten here. And the transition is successive <coughs> and smooth. But how did this actually reflect on caliphal legitimacy? For this, I choose very few features quickly to share with you. Oops. Aye. Abdurrahman III became a caliph through an act of selection. He was selected by God, and he was selected by the people. Ibn Abd he tells us that one of the virtues of Abdurrahman III is that he was the first to be called Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander of the faithful. This corresponds with the letter of proclamation that Abdurrahman sent when he decided to become a caliph. 
where he says, we, Abdurrahman III, are the most worthy to fulfill our right, haq, and the most entitled to complete our good fortune, and to put on the divine robes granted by the nobility of God. God has made the hopes of the world depend on us, allaka, allaka alayna, and made their rejoicing at good news be about our reign, dawla. And based on that, so we decided to be called the commander of the faith. Um, Abdurrahman was clearly competing with the Fatimids in North Africa. And uh, some suggest that this competition with the Fatimid Caliphate in North Africa was one incentive for why he became a caliph. But what's interesting for me here is that he borrowed the argument for legitimacy that uh, the Fatimids had. If they claim to be the, the, if their caliph claimed to be the Mahdi, Abdurrahman too could claim to be a Mahdi. And um, uh, uh, Professor Fiera talks about how Ibn Hazm mentions Abdurrahman as Al Qa'im, which is another uh, title for the Mahdi, but also Ibn Abd he has this entire section dedicated to Al Mahdi. And he uses all the expressions like Jumra, Burhan, Ma'dan. Zilzal, and they're all coming from the prophetic traditions predicting the arrival of the savior of the world. Um, the, the third element I want to talk about is how Abdurrahman claims that his legitimacy is coming from the revival of two stages. First, the Abdurrahman I, who founded the Umayyad um, Emirate in Al-Andalus, who fled when the Abbasids took over Damascus and was in hiding in North Africa for five years and then crossed into Al-Andalus and started a new emirate. Um, and this actually, the revival of the story of Abdurrahman I, again, Professor Fierro talks about how in the north, King Alfonso III did the same thing by claiming his legitimacy based on Alfonso I. So he was perhaps borrowing that example. I will share one small thing about that competition with Alfonso III, um, who claimed to be reviving um, the, the glory of Spain from before the Islamic arrival. And he had the evidence by his possession and protection of the relics of um, St. James in Santiago de Compostela. So, so this is part of the an ongoing project that RCC here at Harvard, at Harvard is uh, supervising. So I'm suggesting that perhaps it was a model that Abdurrahman and his son Al-Hakam borrowed when they set up the shrine for um, uh, the Mishaf of Osman, which is the copy of the Quran that supposedly the third ruler in Islam was reading from when he was killed and it has few drops of his blood on it. So the Umayyads claimed that they have that copy. They put it up in a shrine and they had this uh, Friday ceremony, um, you know, set up uh, uh, surrounding that, that relic. The last, the last point is that Abdurrahman decided that he's not an emir belonging to, the, to Cordoba but he's a caliph belonging to a broader group of rulers. And we have the names of what rulers exactly he thought fit in that category. His great-grandfather, Abdurrahman I, Muawiyah, the founder of the Umayyad dynasty, Abdul Malik bin Marwan, uh, Al-Mansur, Harun al-Rashid, and Al-Ma'mun. This is a category of rulers who had long successful reign who also are considered founders of sort. But also, most importantly, these are rulers who won their reputation. So this is the category he wants to be part of. Rather than apprehending the, Umayyad, uh, the Umayyads of Al-Andalus as a separate form of rulership that developed in the West, independent of the Eastern tradition, which is often the way we look at them, or as a venture divorced from the culture within which it had been Produce, I would suggest we approach it as an opportunity to reflect on the notion of legitimacy and to explore the political realm's profound engagement with forms of knowledge production. 
So here's what I'm claiming here. It's the tools, the values, the ideals, and attitudes the Andalusi culture very successfully advance in its fascination with anthologies as a form of knowledge production that allowed the Umayyad Caliph to first devise a new title for himself, to choose and borrow from multiple realms and models, and to reimagine the world in a new order where he and his capital are enshrined at the center. Within the prism of readership, we may understand the Umayyad Caliphate as a project which speaks to a community that is deeply and profoundly familiar with the ideals of conservation, as enabled by a worldview that at once accepts multiplicity and demands an act of selection. Its abstracted, fragmentary representation of the encyclopedic form that was advanced and cultivated in the cultural realm allowed the Caliphate to become. So Abdul Rahman did not actually stand by the um, ruins to weep the loss of the first Umayyad Caliphate. Uh, he did not sit by the palm tree as the myth that we circulate about the Umayyads either. But Ibn Abd Rabbi he brings back that imagery in speaking um, of the abandoned campsite of ruins. Um, Speaking about Abdul Rahman, he says, وَجَدَّدَ الْمُلْكَ بَعْدَ أَنْ أَخْلَقَ حَتَّى رَسَدْ أَوْتَادُهُ وَاسْتَوْثَقَ So he's bringing back the imagery of tent, a tent with loose pegs about to be blown away and destroyed. And he's using it instead of that classical imagery of weeping, he's actually using it to show that it was uh, an institution of uh, a renewal for the rulership. Abd Rahman did not either mount a magic horse to travel the world either, like Ibn Shuhayd. Yet, by attending to eclectic tendencies, he was addressing the people of Al Andalus, his immediate readers, with whom he successfully curated a world order in which his caliphate and his capital equaled and surpassed all that came before. Thank you. <laughs>